First Samuel chapter 25. It's been a while since we've been in First Samuel, uh, several weeks, uh, just because of the time that I was away. But in First Samuel 24, just to bring us up to speed and remind us where we're at in the story, remember that um, David was being pursued by Saul. He finds him in the cave in the previous chapter. And we talked about how David kind of had Saul where he wanted him and showed him mercy. And we talked about how that's probably why, you know, the Lord showed him uh, a great deal of mercy later in his life was the mercy that he had upon Saul in moments like that. And in 1 Samuel 25, there's a few things we can learn. I think one, probably the theme here would, do, would be talking about, you know, um, you know the, the power of the tongue, you know, both to get yourself in trouble and to get yourself out of trouble. You see that with Nabal and Abigail. You know, you got one guy who's just kind of spouting off at the mouth, and then you've got the Abigail who's going, and she's answering wisely. She's using, uh, she, you know, she's entreating David, and so on and so forth. And we'll get to all that. But there are a few other uh, things that we could touch on along the way, and probably one of those things is right there in first uh, chapter one, where, or verse one. It says, "And Samuel died, and all Israelites were gathered together and lamented him and buried him in his house at Ramah." And David arose and went down to the wilderness of Paran. Now, I don't know if that's telling us that David, you know, was able to go to the funeral. I'm sure he wanted to be there. Uh, you know, when we left him in 24, he was in a stronghold. And, you know, he, he left, he left uh, Saul, and he, but he, didn't, he went back into the wilderness. He didn't, you know, and, and maybe, you know, it seemed like Saul had kind of come to terms, you know, had a moment of peace with him. They had kind of had a little bit of a temporary peace tree. Maybe David was able to go. And I don't know. Uh, I'm sure he wanted to be there no matter what. But what's interesting about this is that this is really, it's all said about Samuel's death. And, you know, Samuel's a very significant character in, in, the, in the Bible. You know, uh, often, in, in, I can't, you know, just thinking off the top of my head, in Psalms, um, it talks about, you know, if Saul's so, it, it, mentioned alongside Moses. You know, if, if Moses and, 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 and Samuel, rather, I'm sorry, stood before me. You know, he's, he's mentioned along great men of God like Moses. So this wasn't just, oh, and Samuel died, you know. But I believe the Bible is kind of, doesn't go into a lot of detail about it. Um, maybe to show us something, you know, that, that, you know, life goes on. When people die, whoever they are, however important they were to us, that, you know, life has to go on. You have to move on with your life at some point. Now, I'm not saying... You know, the Bible's being cold-hearted to hear, and neither should we, that we should just say, oh, yeah, well, everybody, everybody dies, you know, and just, it's the way it goes. Obviously, there's a lamenting that takes place. They said, it says there, they lamented him. But it doesn't say that they went on and on, and just, you know, their whole life was over, and they just, nobody knew what to do, knew what to do, and it was just, it was a hopeless case. You know, Samuel died, and they, they lamented him appropriately, and then they went on with their life. You know, and that's something that we need to understand in life, is that, you know, we're going to lose people that are dear to us, you know, and we're going to lament them. And it's going to be sad and it's going to be sorry, but, you know, we need to move on with our life at some point. And, and we should never, you know, mock or I wouldn't say mock, you know, maybe criticize is the word. Criticize people who maybe we think didn't lament long enough. You know, maybe some, we'll see somebody go through something, lose someone, and then it seems like they turn around a little bit quicker than, some, than we might th expect them to and move on with their life. And, you know, we should never criticize people for that because there's really no one size fit, fits all, you know, time of mourning. You know, oh, this person in your life died. You must lament X amount of days. Right. And, and the world and this, I'm bringing this up because the world does have a different take on this. The world has a different philosophy when it comes to this idea of mourning. You know, they're going to be the ones that want to, uh, you know, give medications, suggest therapy. You know, you know, avoiding big decisions. I remember when my, my mother passed away. You know, the, the, the grief counselor, her advice was don't make any major life decisions for the next two years. Because this is just, this is, you know, and, and, and it was. I mean, she died young, 50s of cancer. You know, she should, you know, a lot of people live a lot longer. Of course, it's a tragedy. And there was, we mourned, we lamented. And, but, uh, you know, she, I remember her coming to me and saying, you, you should take two years and not make any life decisions. I was married a year later. <laughs> so, didn't really heed that advice, but I'm just I'm just bringing this up because you know we need to make sure that our we have a, an understanding from the Bible. What does the Bible teach? What are the biblical examples? And here with Samuel and, and others, you'll see that there is a time of lamenting, but normally it's about thirty to forty days. You know, when uh, when, when Joseph uh, passed away, they lamented for thirty days. I believe it was maybe it was forty. Same with Moses and others, Aaron, these great men of God, when they died, there was a time lamenting, 
You know, they mourned his passing for a, a, you know, a month or so, and then they moved on with their life. You know, and, and people need to be able to move on with their life and not just dwell in the, in, in the doldrums. And here's the thing, if maybe somebody does seem to mourn longer than that, maybe they are a little bit more you know, depressed about it longer than we might expect, you know, that's not a reason to criticize it. Because like, you know, we shouldn't turn to 1 Samuel 25 or something like that and say, look, 30 days is all you got. You know, it's been 40 days, why don't you just get over it? You know, there's no one size fits all, you know, remedy when it comes to mourning the loss of somebody. Everybody has to grieve in their own way and their own pace and so on and so forth. And, you know, if, if anything, that'll help us when we go through that process, but even more so, it should help us the way we, you know, might perceive somebody else when they go through a loss like that. If we say, boy, it seems like they got over that kind of quick, well, you know, good. That's a good thing to get on with, with life and move on. People need to be able to move on. <coughs> you know, there is a time to put off sorrow. And, there's, and here's the thing, as, as Christians, we, we don't mourn, like it says in 1 Thessalonians, we don't mourn as others which have no hope. You know, because we know, you know, if our lost, if, if the ones that we lose, our loved ones are saved, we're going to see them again. Like, the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians that they which are asleep. To us, it's like they just went to, they're just taking a, you know, a dirt nap, as they say, right? They're just taking a long rest. And we're going to see them again. It's a lot harder on the world when they don't have that hope. You know, like when my mother passed away, I believe, you know, she got saved on her deathbed. And that allowed me to kind of move on a little bit quicker. But I had other family members who didn't believe what I believe. And to them, it's like, we'll never see her again. You know, the sad truth is, you know, unless things change, that is the case. But not because of where she, you know, because you guys are going to be two different places, you know, if, unless you get saved. <laughs> so here's the thing, you know, we shouldn't. Just try to, uh, under, we need to understand that when people die, you know, we have hope. Christians should mourn differently, and we should be allowed to move on with their lives. I don't want to spend all night on that, but it's there in 1 Samuel. It's just interesting how it just says, and Samuel died, you know, he gets one verse, pretty much, to mention his passing, and then it's just right into the story. You know, I think God is showing us there that even a great man like Samuel, you know, people need to just lament, mourn, and then it's time to move on with life because we know that we're going to see them again. <laughs> in fact, we're going to see Samuel again uh, <laughs> at the end of the book. But, um, uh, you know, there's a time to weep, there's a time to laugh, there's a time to mourn, there's a time to dance. And, you know, everyone's, gonna, everyone's seasons are going to be different. But let's move on with the story here. It says in verse 2, And there was a great man in Maon whose possessions were in Carmel, and the man was very great. And he had 3,000 sheep and 1,000 goats, and he was shearing his sheep in Carmel. So he had great riches. Now the name of the man was Nabal, and the name of his wife Abigail, and she was a woman of good understanding and of a beautiful countenance. But the man was churlish and evil in his doings, and he was of the house of Caleb. So a few things here. One, I guess opposites do attract, right? So you have this, this woman of good understanding, and for some reason she's with this bozo, right? I mean, unless maybe there's something else to her character that we don't know about. Maybe she's, you know, a gold digger or something like that. I don't know, I guess is the term, right? But, uh, it, you know, it seems like an odd pairing here, okay? And, and also the other thing that we see here is that uh, it says there at the end that he was of the house of Caleb. And if you remember, Caleb was one of the, the, the two good spies that came back when they spied out the land. And then later in his years, we talked about it, I believe, on Sunday morning, where he was the one that said, give me that mountain. I'm as strong in my, in my 80, at 80 as I was in 40. And he went out and he did that great work for God and took the, the mountain of the Amorites. And it just goes to show you that a good reputation is not inherited. You know, this, by the time it gets all the way down to, to this guy here, this uh, um, Nabal, you know, that good name that, that uh, Caleb had has kind of gone away. You know, uh, you have to earn your own good name. You know, you should live up to a good name. If, if, if your parents gave you a good name, I'm of the house of Russell, you know, my, you know, I should try to uphold that. But, you know, it's showing us here that you can ruin it, too. You know, Nabal here, he kind of messed it up. But the other thing I want to focus in on, if you would go to Proverbs chapter 31, and keep something in Proverbs, we're going to read several Proverbs tonight, is this, idea, this, this, this gal, uh, Abigail. And it says there that she was a woman of good understanding and of a beautiful countenance. <coughs> and and I, I preached about this recently in a, in a sermon called uh, Beauty is Vain. 
But what this is showing us here, I believe, is that good understanding is better than beauty. Now, she had both, okay? But it's better to have good understanding than to have beauty, okay? Look at Proverbs 31, verse 30. Of course, this is a famous proverb about the virtuous woman. It says that favor is deceitful and beauty is vain, okay? So beauty is only skin deep, as they say, right? Beauty is vain. Beauty is not going to last. It's not something that lasts a whole lifetime, even people, when they're, when they're young and beautiful, they, you know, we all grow old, so on and so forth. Beauty fades. That goes away. But, you know, good understanding, favor, or excuse me, good understanding, rather, you know, that's something that remains. In fact, that's something that can improve over time. As the years go on, we have more wisdom, more understanding. That is something that can increase, whereas beauty is not that way. And we've all seen... You know, the, 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 move, the starlets who try to hang on to that beauty that they had, you know, when they first started out in the business, right? When they're first getting into Hollywood and all that, and they've been hired for their looks, you know, on the, on the big screen, and then they get older, as we all do, and next thing you know, they're getting all the work done, right? And everything's getting stretched out and pulled back, and, and it's like, you know, <laughs> you could take one look at them and go, oh, yeah. You've been under the knife more than once, right? And, and, and what are they trying to do? They're trying to hold on to something that the Bible says is vain, something that's going to pass away, something that's not going to last. You know, if they, people that uh, are smart are going to focus on that first part of Abigail's better qualities, is that she was of good understanding. Because that's not something that fades away. I mean, it can. You can definitely lose that. But that is actually something you could build upon. That is something you could add to. That is something that you can improve over the years that can grow better and better. <coughs> the Bible says beauty is a, a favor is deceitful and beauty is vain. But a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. Now, the world isn't going to praise her. That's not who's going to, you know, that's not who's going to praise uh, the, the woman that fears the Lord. It's not going to be the world. They're never going to have, you know, some big ceremony where they bring up all the housewives and say, you know, the mother of the year award goes to so-and-so, and she's going to give her speech and say, I'd like to thank, and so that's never going to happen. But, I mean, they'll, they'll have all kinds of, you know, Miss America pageants and all these other things where they, what, they do what? They celebrate the way they look. You know, how well they can put Vaseline on their teeth and make that smile work, you know, and all these stupid, vain things that they do. The Bible says that woman that feared the Lord, she shall be praised, though. But who is it that's going to praise her? Not the world. It's going to be her husband, her children that rise up early and call her blessed, that honor her. You know, and those are, you know, that's, the, that's the praise that matters most, and the people that are closest to us. And you know, that's the people that we should want to hear from the most. Go to Proverbs chapter 11. Proverbs chapter 11. I remember when I was newly saved and young and single, this is a, a verse that stuck in my head. And it's always been with me. Proverbs chapter 11. Because it's, it's, I just love the way the Bible uses these illustrations. And God uses these illustrations to really make an impression on us. So we won't forget certain things, right? In Proverbs chapter 11, verse 22, look there in verse 22. It says, As a jewel of gold in a swine's snout, so is a fair woman which is without discretion. And there's, you know, I've heard this preached different ways. And I've, I've had different opinions about exactly what it means over the, over the years. But I believe what he's saying here is that, you know, no matter what you do to a pig, at the end of the day, it's a pig. It doesn't matter how, many, how much jewelry you put on it, how much you paint it up. Like it, at the end of the day, it's still a pig. You take this nice, beautiful jewel and put it in a swine snout, and, and you're going to say, well, it's still a pig. Because it's, it's, you know, that's not enough. That one jewel isn't enough to, you know, convince you that it's anything else. You know, and, and, and beauty is like that jewel. You know, it's something that it would complement somebody of good understanding even more, you know. But if it's, if it's, if it's on, put on, on, a, on a woman without understanding, it's like putting a jewel on a pig, basically. You know, the way I've heard this preached, and, you know, I can see what they're saying when they preach this, is that it's a kind of a waste, basically. You know, it, it's, it's a bit of a waste. Take something that's very beautiful and then waste it on something like a pig. You know, a, a beautiful woman without understanding, it's kind of a waste. You know, it's, it's unfortunate. <coughs> What's interesting, and you know, Abigail is a great picture of this because of the fact that it was her, you know, she exemplifies the, the, uh, the value of good understanding over beauty. 
Now, she had both. You know, she, she was easy on the eyes, but she also had the good understanding, too. But what was it that day that saved her and all of Nabal's house? Was it her beauty? Did David, did David ride up there to go kill everybody and see Abigail and say, well, we can't, well, I mean, we're not going to kill all these people. I mean, just look at her. Right? She didn't just, you know, it doesn't say when she heard the messengers were coming that she went in and did herself up and got her hair just right and put on the makeup and got the right everything on and went out and stood by the way and just kind of stood there and waited for David to, you know, lay his eyes on her and come to his senses. No, she went, she had, it was her good understanding that saved the day. Okay? Now again, you know, I believe pointing out the fact that she's of a beautiful countenance as in order to contrast it with the fact that she was of good understanding and that, that is what really mattered. And that's really what matters in, in, in life, is, 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 you know, especially when it comes to, you know, looking for a spouse. You know, we should desire somebody that has good understanding and, and not just, you know, is easy on the eyes. You know, that, that's, that's a nice bonus and I'm not saying we shouldn't be attracted you know, to, uh, to our mates, you know, the people that we're going to spend our lives with, that, that needs to be there. But it's not the most important thing. It's not the most important thing. What the most important thing is that they have good understanding. I mean, if you get married to a person for the wrong reasons, you know, just because, well, I know they have a terrible character, uh, you know, they're not saved, they don't, or maybe they're saved, but, you know, they're not really in church, they don't love the Lord, they're really not into the Bible, and you are, and you're going to marry that person because they're good looking, that's, you know, that, that, they're not going to be so good looking for, for very long. You know, the, eventually the, what's really going to come through is their character. And that's really what's, you know, it doesn't matter how attractive you find them at the first. If they lack good understanding, it's going to make your life miserable. Yeah, and people need to talk these things through. People need to have, come, ha, have an understanding of, of, of who it is that they're getting involved with. From, from go, you know, if you're serious about somebody, you know, you should, things should, you know, in time, you know, it, it, people should talk about things like child rearing, you know, it, how are we going to raise kids, because, you know, first comes love, then comes ma marriage, then comes the baby in the baby carriage, that adage rings true, and if you're not on the same page when it comes to child rearing, you know, that can be a major point of contention. Or how about, you know, who's gonna, what roles are we going to fulfill as husband and wife? Are you going to fulfill the, the, the biblical role as a husband, as a provider, the sole provider? Are you going to fulfill the role as the wife, biblically speaking, keep her at home, raise the children, so on and so forth? You know, people, and, and I've seen it, and I'm, I bring it up because I see it happen all the time, even in Baptist churches where people just get married without ever talking about any of these things. They just assume, well, they're in a Baptist church and they, they're playing the part and they look right and they got everything. They're just put together so nice. And the next thing you know, they're, they're married and, and, and they don't agree on some of these things. Well, what do you mean I got to stay home now? I can't work. Yeah, I'm the husband. I'm the provider. You stay home. Or she gets, you know, out of, been out of shape and he gets a little, you know, authoritative, raises his voice maybe and says, hey, this is the way it's going to be, puts his foot down. And I've seen him go running back to daddy. And, and, and so that's a wicked thing. It's even more wicked when mommy and daddy are like, oh, come right on in, sweetheart. And they basically end up fostering divorce, you know, which is wicked. And why is it? Because people don't talk about things like this. They don't talk about things where you got to make sure the other person has good understanding in these areas. That they're on, you're on the same page when it comes to these issues of life that really matter fulfilling the biblical role of how you're going to raise children, of how, who's going to do what in the home. You know, these things have to be worked out. And if you're not on the same page, I don't care how good looking the other person is. You know, good, it's, their beauty isn't going to save the day. Their good understanding is what's going to make things last. Okay? That's what did it for Abigail. You know, she went down there, she opened her mouth, she did some other things, and you know, her good understanding is what you know, kept everybody alive that day. So you see, first of all, with Abigail, that you know, she was not only beautiful, but she was also of good understanding, which is what really matters. And then we had this man, Nabal, in verse 3, right? It says that he was churlish, which is kind of a, a, a word that's kind of fallen out of season, obviously. I don't think we've probably ever used that in our modern vernacular. If I were to call you churlish today, you might say, well, thank you. Because you have, you have no idea what that means, right? <laughs> but churlish basically just means, you know, a very rude person. 
very rude. Now, if I said rude, we probably all know what I meant. Uh, and, and not just rude, but mean-spirited. I mean, rude beyond just like, you know, they don't say thank you. But they're, they're rude to the point where they're actually a mean-spirited. Or another word, you know, surly, a, a bad-tempered person. Basically, what's showing us is that this Nabal guy has a really bad temper. And he's a very rude person. And he's very mean-spirited. You know, and I was listening to the scripture being read. You know, it reminded me of 1 Timothy 6 where it says, They that will be rich fall into temptation and snare into many hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. I was thinking, man, that's a great picture of Nabal. Because he was a very great man. You know, his possessions were in one place and he was in another. And he had all these oxen and all these asses and all these sheep. He had all this wealth. But you know what? It, it, it made him into a churlish person. And that's ended actually ended up getting him killed. You know, and so uh, this is the character that Nabal had. And we see how rude he is in his response to David, right? When David, and basically David is setting out saying, hey, you know, I was protecting your guys in the way, you know, your shepherds were out there and I was, you know, I was a wall to them as they described him, that no harm came to them. We didn't take anything. And he's basically asking for a favor. You know, and, and maybe this guy, maybe if Nabal had gone about it differently and said, you know what, I, I appreciate it, but, you know, I really don't owe you anything. You know, I think really what got David going was the way he went about it, was the way he responded, was very rude. He said there in verse 10, And Nabal answered David's servants and said, Who is David? And who is the son of Jesse? So he's kind of discounting him. You know, and David, you know, might have had, and I don't believe David was right in what he was doing here and going, and, and even, I think he admits this at the end. We'll see that at the end of the story if you, you might have caught that. And I think he's, you know, maybe what kind of put David over the edge here is that he's kind of been getting a lot of that, you know, from one guy in particular named Saul, who's kind of got this, well, who are you? You know, you're not going to be the king. And he's kind of being dismissive of David here. Who is David? Who is the son of Jesse? There be many servants nowadays that break away every man from his master. He's like, he's just saying, oh, you know, you're just another rebel. You're just another young punk rebel. You know, who's got a problem with authority. I don't owe you anything. And just basically blows off David. So his response was very rude. You know, because David did do all these things. David did, you know, look out for Nabal's possessions and, and helped him without even being asked. And then he's very mean in his treatment towards, you know. He said, shall I take then my bread and my water and my flesh that I have killed from my shears and given unto men whom I know not whence they be? So he's just being very rude, very churlish towards him. And he's being very mean. And, and, of course, we know how the story ends with Nabal, right? He almost gets killed by David, and then the Lord actually takes him out for David. But I think there's a lesson that we can, you know, there's a life lesson that, to be learned here. And that is, you know, this. Be careful who you mouth off to. <laughs> it's true. You better be careful who you blow your mouth off to, because you never know who it is you're talking to. You know, and I remember, I remember someone telling me that when I was 15, because, you, you know, I'm sure this will come as a shock to everybody, but I was very lippy as a young, young teenager. I always had, I was very sarcastic. I always had some kind of, some smart to say, and it was, you know, got me in trouble more than once. But I remember one particular individual who just, just I said something, and one day he just kind of got quiet and looked at me and said, you know what? One day you're going to say the wrong thing to the wrong guy. And he used some other call for language in there to kind of drive his point home. And I remember that just stuck with me. And I said, I wonder if he's right about that. And, you know, I remember, and it turned out he was. Because <laughs> I remember, you know, walking. Uh, I don't remember how this exactly happened. We were, I, was, I was out skateboarding. Yeah, see? <laughs> Believe it or not, you know, 100 pounds and two decades ago it happened. Right? I could heel flip. It's true. And... Uh, we were out skateboarding in the middle of the street, and this guy drove by. And it was like a residential street, and he yelled something, like, get out of the street, you know, which, whatever. You know, maybe he was having a bad day. And I can't remember if it was me or my buddy, but we, either myself or him, it was probably me, yelled something smart back at him. And I just remember hearing the, lo- the, the, the tires, you know, lock up, and this just jacked, like, marine. I mean, like, full fatigues. You know, tucked in the, the, sh- the pants are tucked in the boots. He just gets out, I mean, just stopped in the middle of the street and just starts marching right at me. And he's just like, come over here and say that, I'll tell you. know, and he was just cussing me out. And we were out of there at a shot. <laughs> the good thing we had skateboards, we were just fast, right? But those words rang true at that moment. That, hey, one day you're going to say the wrong thing to the wrong guy. And apparently nobody ever told that to Nabal. 
Now, you ought to be careful who you just start running your mouth about because you never know what that person is capable of. And, and you know, uh, that, I think that's good life advice, you know. I mean, you see it all the time with, with people that get involved in road rage and stuff like that. I mean, they get into these incidents with, with you know, they get into some interaction on a, on, a, on a freeway somewhere, and next thing you know, the shots are being fired. Yeah. People pull guns on each other nowadays. It's, it's crazy out there. You know, the, the best policy is to just be a peaceful person, be somebody who just wants to always de-escalate uh, uh, situations and get out of those things. Don't let your pride get in the way like Nabal here. Because you never know, you know, you might be talking to a guy like David who's, who's armed to the teeth or something like that. <laughs> so the Bible says in Proverbs in 13, chapter 13, verse 3, He that keepeth his mouth keepeth his life, the Bible says. He that keepeth his mouth keepeth his life. You know, if Nabal had just shut up that day and just said, yeah, whatever you need, David. You know, he probably would have kept his, his life. He probably would have kept his wife. You know, he probably would have carried on. But he opened up wide his lips, right? He, he opened, as it says, he that openeth wide his lips shall have destruction. It was his mouth that got him in trouble that day. It was the way he responded to David. His words, you know, but the things that we say have uh, a lot of power behind them. We should be careful about the things that we say to other people. The Bible says in James 3, we're all familiar with it, where it talks about the tongue, Right? It says in verse 1, Brethren, my, my brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. For in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man and able to bridle the whole body. The Bible, and he goes on and talks about how the tongue is this little member, yet it sets on, uh, on, on fire the course of hell. That it's, it's the smallest among members, and yet it's, it's powerful. Just like a, and he used the illustration of how you know, a great ship is steered by a very small rudder. You know, our tongue's very powerful things. Words have a lot of power behind them, for good or bad. And he said there that if you're able to tame the tongue, if you're able to offend not in word, the same as a perfect man, able to bridle also the whole body. And whenever I think about that passage, I think about how, well, how I heard it preached one day, that if you would just focus on your tongue, the things that come out of your mouth, a lot of other things in your life would just start to fall in place. The things that you think, the things that you do, so on and so forth. If you would just focus on, you know, your tongue, because your tongue is so, you know, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. So if you start to be more careful about the things you say and how you say them, by the way, you would probably, you know, start keeping a lot of other things in check in your life, too. Because you might start saying, well, you would go to say something and go, man, where did that come from? Why did I even want to say that? What would compel me for those words to even enter my mind, let alone come out of my lips? It would cause you, cause you probably to start to search your heart and say, these things are coming from my heart. You know, if you're able to bridle the tongue, you're able to bridle also the whole body, the Bible says. But the Bible says the tongue can no man tame. So it's not, you know, it's, you know no one's perfect in this area. And it's a lot of work, you know, but it's something that does need to be worked at. Too bad Nabal didn't work at it a little harder, right, for, him, for his sake. And, of course, we know the story here. You know, there's a lot of, of Scripture here, so I'm not going to take the time. Hopefully you were listening as it was being read to review all of this. But uh, basically, you know, the young men, his servants come, and they say, hey, you know, David did do this for us. You know, he wants us to give him something in return. And it wasn't like David was asking out of greed. David was wandering in the wilderness. David is, you know, trying to, he's not, he doesn't know where his next meal is going to come. He's not like we see Nabal. In a, in, later in the chapter, he's, it says feasting as a king. You know, he's not just sitting around having, he's eating like David should be eating. David, you know, should have been a king. He's out wandering in the wilderness, not, you know, not knowing where his next meal is going to come from. And he's asking for a little something in return for what he did for Nabal. And he gets this rude response. <coughs> it's not like David was asking just so he could, you know, profit, or, you know, or add it to his, you know, his, 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 uh, his riches or something like that. He had nothing. He was out wandering. And he gets this, uh, you know, this rude, this curt, churlish response from him. And it says in verse 12, So David's young men turned their way and went again and came, told him all these sayings. And David said unto his men, this is verse 13, Gird ye on every man a sword. And they girded up every man a sword. And David also girded on his sword. And they went up after him about 400 men and 200 abode by the stuff. So I don't know how many guys, you know, Nabal's got, but he's got quite the fight on his hands. 
You know, it's like you talk smack to the one guy, and he comes back with, you know, six other dudes or whatever. And it, he goes and gets his, his buddies kind of a thing. <coughs> but it says in verse 14, and this is where Abigail comes into the picture, but one of the young men told Abigail, Nabal's wife, saying, Behold, David sent messengers out of the wilderness to salute our master, and he railed on them. But the men were very good doing us, and we, not, we, uh, and we were not hurt, neither missed we anything, as long as we were conversant with them when we were in the fields. They were a wall unto us by both day and night. Excuse me, by night and day. All the while we were with them keeping the sheep. Now therefore know and consider what thou wilt do, for evil is determined against our master and against all his household. For he is such a son of Belial that a man cannot speak to him. So the servants are coming to Abigail. They, you know, her, her reputation seems to have preceded her. They say, you know, it's not going to do any good to talk to, to, to Nabal. You know, his mind's made up. Let's go talk. They're trying to save their own skin because David's not just going to come and kill Nabal. He said he's not going to leave any that pissed against the wall. He's going to kill all the men, right? So he's going to, that's why these men are like, well, let's go talk to Abigail because, you know, she's reasonable. And she's at least got the wisdom to know. And she's saying, and they say to her, you know, you know, consider what thou wilt do, for evil is determined against our master. I mean, these are the guys that were there with David. They saw the 400 men. They saw all the spears and the swords and the bows and the arrows and the armor and everything else they had. They're like, they know that David's going to come and, you know, wreck shop. I mean, he's, he's going to take care of business. So they're trying to save their skin. And they go to Abigail and it kind of shows that Abigail, you know, she obviously must have been known for having understanding. Like, well, if we talk to her, you know, there's a chance that we're going to be able to save our hides here. Because notice there it says at the end of verse 17 about Nabal, he is such a son of Belial that a man cannot speak to him. Now again, son of Belial saying he's a son of the devil. You know, and this is really a whole topic in and of itself. Because I think a lot, you know, a lot of times people get this idea that if you're not saved, you're a son of the devil. You're either a son of God or you're a son of the devil. That's not the way it works. You know, you, you're either the son of, you're either a born again child of God or you're unsaved, right? And then there's being the son of the devil, which is being what the Bible calls a reprobate. You know, not everybody that's not saved is a reprobate. Not everybody that's not saved is a son of the devil. You know, and sometimes we have to kind of temper that attitude that we get sometimes with lost people and say, well, you know, they're just these wicked, horrible people. It's like, they're sinners just like me and you. They're, that doesn't mean they're all just the most, you know, vile scum to ever be <laughs> walk the face of the earth. You know, we should always never have that attitude. And I, I say that because I've seen that, where people get this, attitude where you know if you're not saved you're nobody you're just you're obviously just this horrible person and we forget the fact that we were one time unsaved as well but Nabal did deserve this testimony that he was a son of Belial and what is it that they say about him they say that a man cannot even speak to him that's the reputation he had as a son of Belial that he's unreasonable that it does no good it's like talking to a wall we've all heard that phrase right and that's exactly what the Bible says reprobates are like. It says in Romans 1 with, that they are without understanding, that they are covenant breakers, kind of like, kind of like Nabal, right? I mean, David's doing him a favor. He's not going to do it back. He's a bit of a covenant breaker in a way. But it says they're without natural affection. I mean, wouldn't, wouldn't a normal person appreciate what David did for them? I mean, you're this guy with great wealth. You have more than you need. And there's this guy, David, who just, un, un, without even being asked, just takes it upon himself to guard your sheep and to guard your employees and make sure nothing goes missing, doesn't take anything from them, but he's just, just armed security. What, and then all he asks in return is like, hey, would you mind feeding us? Would you mind giving us some provisions so we don't starve to death out in the wilderness? You know, the normal person would say, yeah, of course. What else? Thank you. Would be, you know, they, would be, they would have natural affection, right? They would have a natural just gratitude. I mean, everyone has that. You know, even unsaved people, you do something nice, they'll say, oh, thanks. I mean, you hold the door open for some stranger, thank you, is you know, the normal response. It's just there's a natural affection there that reprobates lack, that the sons of devil lack. The sons of the devil, they don't have this. They are without natural affection. And it, that plays out in so many ways today. It comes across and manifests itself. That unnat, that lacking of natural affection comes across in so many ways in society today. But it also says that they're implacable, that they cannot be placated. There, there's no sense in speaking to them. That's what they said about Nabal here. 
He's such a son of Spelial that a man cannot speak to him. They're implacable. They're unmerciful. You can't, you can't reason with these people. You can't, you can't negotiate with them. There's no sense in compromising with people who are not going to be compromised with. And that's why it's so stupid to watch Christians fall over themselves trying to placate the implacable. You know, trying to tiptoe around, you know, the homo crowd. You know, and say, oh, they're welcome in church, but it's still a sin. And then it's like, oh, you know, we're not going to do their wedding, but, you know, they could still come to church because they're sinners. It, it doesn't, it doesn't, why, if, if they can't be placated, why even try at all? Why not just, just, you know, just hold your ground? Why give them an inch? You give them an inch, they're going to take a mile. Because that's what they want. They don't want compromise. They want everything. They don't want to just come in church and, and attend church. They want to be behind the pulpit. They want, to, they want to change what the Bible says. They want to change everyone's mind on their filthy lifestyle and so on and so forth. And, and I don't want to get caught up in all that t tonight, but you know, this is a good example of what a, what a reprobate is like. A son of Beal like Nabal. You know, and by the way, they can be successful in the world, can't they? They can go out and achieve a lot in the world by being what? By being stingy, rude, hard people like Nabal was. <laughs> so they're coming to, Nate, to Abigail saying, look, they're just not going to do anything good to go talk to Nabal. We all know what he's like. That, that son of, the son of that son of, a, of, of Belial. And it says in verse 18, Then Abigail made haste and took 200 loaves and two bottles of wine. So she gets in the kitchen, right? This, now take note, okay? This is a real important lesson. <laughs> she runs to the kitchen and she starts making a meal, right? Two bottles of wine, five sheep already dressed, five measures of parched corn, and hundred of clusters of raisins and 200 cakes of figs and laid them on asses. That's all David wanted to begin with. She's like, well, let's get a meal to put together for him. This is the wisdom of Abigail tonight. And the wisdom is this, that a way to the man's heart is through his stomach. <laughs> All right? You think that these things are just, you know, people, we hear these old phrases and these sayings. The Bible, you know, it rings true in Scripture. Oh, David's upset. He's just hangry, you know. <laughs> he just needs to eat. <laughs> you just let me get in the kitchen for a while. I'll fix up something. And, you know, it's true. And you know, we've all been there. Sometimes I'll get in a mood. My wife's like, you just need to eat something. <laughs> How many calories have you had today? I know I wouldn't look like it, but sometimes I go without a meal, you know. <laughs> but, you know, even beyond just that practical bit of wisdom there, what's really going on here is that the Bible says in Proverbs 21, a gift in secret pacifieth anger. You know, she's trying to smooth things over with David. She's not just going to go down there and be like, what do you think you're doing? You know, and give him some sass or try to just talk sense into him. She's actually going to send a gift ahead. She's going to send ahead the wine, the corn, the raisins, the figs, she, you know, the meat. She's going to send all these things to him and pacify the anger. You know, it's kind of hard to be mad at somebody when they're bringing you all this delicious food or some kind of a gift. You know, something, and that, you know that's a real practical bit of advice. If you're having a problem with somebody... You know, in the home, you're having, you know, between siblings or at work with a coworker, wherever. If you're in some, there's some relationship in your life where it's just at odds and you don't want it to be that way. You kind of want to, you know, bury the axe or the bury the hatchet with somebody. The, as the saying is, kill them with kindness. Sometimes that's the best way to go about just smoothing things over with people. You know, and I wish I would have learned that earlier on in life with coworkers and stuff like that. I think about people that I just never got along with on the job. You know, and probably all I need to do is just slide that Snickers bar across the table and be like, there you go, buddy. Now this one's on me, you know. Just go ahead and get him something and, and just out of the blue, just say, hey, you know what? I, I, I saw this and I thought of you, you know, and have it be something nice, you know. <laughs> don't hand him like, you know, I don't know, something mean, but a gift in secret pacifieth anger. You know, she doesn't run and get Nabal's p permission. She's doing this because she knows this is the way it's going to work. And it says, in a reward in the bosom, strong wrath, which is what David had. He had strong wrath. I mean, he's on the war path. Literally, he's coming to kill people. And if she hadn't stopped him, there's no doubt in my mind, that's exactly the way the story is about to play out. David's going up there, and it's going to be a bloodbath. But in her wisdom, she pacifies her, his anger, and she, you know, and, and, and dissuades his strong wrath through what? Through the giving of a gift. Through, uh, you know, giving a gift in secret. 
It says in verse 19, And she said unto her servants, Go in on before me. Behold, I come after you. But she told not her husband Nabal. <coughs> and it was so as she rode on the ass. Because Nabal probably would have stopped her. And said something stupid like, Oh, we'll see. Who's David? Yeah, 400 men. Yeah, right. We'll see what he's got. So he's like, No, we're going to do this. We're, and we're going to save some people. And it says in verse 20, it came, and it was so as she rode on the ass that she came down by the covert of the hill. And behold, David and his men came again, down against her, and she met them. Now David had said, Surely in vain I have kept all this fellow hath in the wilderness, so that nothing was missed of all that pertained unto him, and he requited me evil for good. So, and, and more also, do God unto the enemies of David, if I leave of all that pertained to him by the morning light any that pisseth against the wall. So we see what David's, you know, he, what he's upset about is the fact that, you know, he protected everything. Because remember, Nabal was one place and all of his possessions were in another. And David is being a wall of protection to him so that he didn't miss anything of all that pertained unto him. And he gets, you know, requited evil for good. That's what's bothering David here. And he's saying, you know, if I'm, I'm not going to leave anybody that, uh, that, that pisseth against the wall. So he's talking about the men, right? That's a phrase that is used to refer to the men. He's saying, I'm going to kill all the men, is basically what he's saying. And now, it's in my opinion here, and I believe that David reveals this later, towards the end of the chapter, that David is wrong by taking things into his own hands. Which is, it, it, and it seems so out of character for him. Especially after everything we've read about how Saul is pursuing him, and he's, uh, he's being merciful, he's not doing anything. You know, he's, he's, uh, he's, he's letting Saul go when he had him right where he wanted him in the previous chapter. He's suffering because of Saul. He's being persecuted. He's having javelins thrown at him. And really, we know that in all likelihood, David, you know, could have really taken the kingdom, I believe, quite easily. I think if he had just taken Saul out in that cave, I think everybody else would have just gotten on board because Saul's gone. And from what you read about Saul, he wasn't exactly, you know, uh, the most popular guy. I'm sure his tribe of Benjamin, there would have been civil war. Who knows? Anyway. The point is, is that I believe David is wrong here. That he shouldn't have been doing this. And the, and the Bible kind of backs this up and it teaches this principle that, you know, to suffer, to suffer wrongfully is, is thankworthy. You know, and that's what it says in 1 Peter. Uh, I won't have you turn there for sake of time, but it says in verse 19 of 1 Peter 2, For this is thankworthy that if man for conscience saints toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully. You know, God would have rewarded David Either way, you know, it, it, you know, if he hadn't gone on, to, on this, he was going to, you know, God probably would have provided some other thing for him. And it would have been to his righteousness to, you know, been patiently, uh, to, to, to be buffeted, you know, and taken it patiently but for doing well. I mean, he, he was doing the right thing, and then he gets rewarded evil for it. The right response would have been, well, you know, that's the way it is, and to just suffer wrong uh, and take it patiently. It says, this is acceptable with God. If when you do well and suffer for it, you take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. It doesn't say if when you, when you do well and suffer wrongfully and you take it upon yourself to avenge yourself, this is acceptable with God. He says it's when you take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should, ye should follow in his steps. Now, was that, what was Jesus' example? Did Jesus suffer wrongfully? Oh, yeah, more than anybody else ever has. And could Jesus have done something about it? He said, I lay down my life that I might take it up again. No man taketh it from me. And he told Peter, I could even, when they came to rest in the garden, he smote off the servants here. He said, I could presently call now 10,000 legions of angels, and my father would present them, give, give them me. But then how should the scriptures be, be fulfilled? So he suffered wrongfully. He was buffeted not for his faults, but for doing right. And he took it patiently. And that was his example. That's what it's saying here in 1 Peter chapter 2. For even hereunto were ye called. You're called to this. This is the Christian life. Because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps. Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. You know, he wasn't guilty to do anything wrong. He did no sin. No guile was found in his mouth. Who when he was reviled, reviled not again. That's the example of Christ. That's the example that we have to follow. You know, when people revile you and persecute you and do evil towards you, you know what? That's not an excuse for you to revile again. That's an opportunity for you to suffer wrongfully and to be accepted of God. Okay? So don't just read this story and think that David was right for what he was doing. And he even admits it at the end. 
He says that he, he was prevented from doing this evil. And I believe he's, he's coming to his senses a little bit. And you know what? The great thing about that is it just shows us that the men of the Bible, you know, we're just like, we're men of like passions. That they're like me and you, which gives, should give us great hope. That, you know, we can accomplish and, and do the things that they did. You know, that God could use us just like he, they used them, you know, to his, his purposes. So Abigail, she goes down there, she sends the gift ahead to cool him out, to pacify the anger, to turn away the strong wrath. But that's not all she did in this passage, right? And the story goes on. And she opens up her mouth and she starts to talk to him. And Abigail, when you listen to the speech, she has a really nice way of telling David that he's wrong. Basically what I think is going on here. You know, she's making her case. But David, I do believe, is wrong. And, she has a, and I think Abigail knows it. And she has a real nice way of kind of letting him know. And the Bible says in Proverbs 15, a soft answer turneth away wrath. You know, the, the, the peace pacifies, the, the, the gift gi given in secret, that turns away the wrath, but also a soft answer. I mean, I don't care how, much, how delicious that food was. If she showed up and just started, you know, noodle neck and David and giving her, him a piece of her mind, he might have changed his mind about things. Things might not have, you know, it was both of these things in conjunction. It was the gift and it was a soft answer that she had. Her humility. It says, A soft answer turneth away wrath, but grievous words stirreth up anger. And she's down there just, Who do you think you are? You know, you're going to do what? What do you, you know, that would have probably gone wrong for her. The tongue of the wise useth knowledge aright, but the mouth of fools poureth out foolishness, the Bible says. And what that shows us is that it's not just how we say things, I think it's what we can learn from her response. It's not, just, it's not just what we say, it's how you say them. Because really, when you read this, she's kind of telling him, look, you don't do this. If you do this, you're going to be wrong. You're going to regret it later, right? And She's telling him he's wrong, but she has a real nice way of saying it. And what we can learn from this is it's not, you know, you can tell people they're wrong in a nice way. You know, and this, is a, this was an important lesson for me as somebody who has been in the ministry, you know, was put in the ministry, you know, two years ago, in fact, you know, as of today, two-year anniversary. You know, I, I had to learn that. And I used to get so, I would get so worried when I'd, I'd have to go talk to somebody and tell them they're doing something wrong or they need to stop doing this or change something. You know, things that fall within my sphere of influence. I'm not saying, you know, every little thing I notice, it's my job to go, you know, right every wrong I see, you know, because I could stare in the mirror and do that all day. But I'm just saying that there are times where I, as you know, a minister, have to go to someone and say, hey, did you, you need to think about this, or you need to change this, you need to stop that. And I remember I used to bite my nails. I'd get all, I couldn't eat, you know, and my nails are, or my nails, my, my palms are sweaty, and I'm going to talk to this person, and I'm just, I'm all fretting about it. And then, you know, someone took me aside one day and said, you know what, it, it's okay to tell, did you ever think about the fact you can tell people they're wrong in a nice way? Because whenever I'm always thinking about I always think about the way I was told how I was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> right? I'm just like, you idiot, what were you thinking? You know, I'm always getting, you know, ah, not all the time, right? But we always remember the bad things. But I'm always thinking, man, I'm going to have to go talk to this person. I'm just imagining how they're going to blow up and overreact. But the Bible has a promise here that a soft answer turneth away wrath. You know, and then if we use our words right, correctly, you know, you're not going to stir up strife. You're not going to stir up wrath. You know, the person will receive that rebuke. You know, I, I was looking for the, the, the verse. I couldn't find it, but it says that... Uh, you know, a, a, a tongue can break the bones in Proverbs. I don't, I'm paraphrasing. But, you know, sometimes just a, a word fitly spoken in due season, how sweet it is. You know, it's like, it's like apples of gold and pictures of silver. Okay? So it's not just how we, what we say, but it's how we say it a lot of times. And Abigail, she's going to go tell, kind of tell David how it is, and, but she's going to do it in a real nice way. Verse 23 and when Abigail saw David, she hasted and light off her ass and fell before David on her face. She bowed herself to the ground and fell at his feet and said she didn't, you know, notice her approach is very humble, very meek. You know, and, and this is, you know, something that, you know, this is a good way to entreat people that are in authority. You know, and David you know, might not have been, you know, officially king, but she knew. I mean, you re listen to what she said. She knows that he's going to be king one day. And, and she knows that God has anointed him and that he is a person of authority. You know, this is a good way to approach people. I'm not saying you have to literally fall down on your feet, you know, before their feet and come groveling. You know, maybe there is a time and place that's appropriate. I don't know. 
but uh, you know, probably not. That I, not in the situation we probably find ourselves in, in in this day and age. But it does show a spirit of humility, you know, when approaching somebody to kind of come to them and say, "Hey, well, you know, you might want to rethink what you're doing here." And the Bible says, you know, that about when when we uh, to, to rebuke not an elder, but entreat him as a father. You know, so, you know, newsflash, like the, the man of God, David, sometimes the man of God is wrong. I mean, he makes a wrong decision or says something or preaches something that is wrong, you know. And not everything that is wrong needs to be corrected, by the way. Not, you know, people want to get real, you know, overly critical sometimes. But if there is something that does need to be addressed, there's a way to go about it. And it's not this, you know, march right up and just tell you how it is kind of an attitude. It's, it's a meekness. You know, that... that People are more likely to listen to what you have to say if you're going to entreat them meekly and quietly with a humble spirit. <coughs> That's her approach. You know, she's coming to somebody who has a lot of power, a lot of authority. So she comes very meekly, very humbly, and David listens, right? And it says there, and, and, she, and she said in verse 24, uh, Upon me, my Lord, upon me, let this, let this iniquity be. And let thine handmaid, I pray thee, seek thy, uh, sp uh, speak in thine audience and hear the words of thine handmaid. So she's, you know, just all oh, you can see the supplication here, the humility. Let my, my Lord, I pray thee, regard this man of Belial for even Nabal, even Nabal, for as his name, so he is. Nabal is his name and folly is with him. Saying, look, he, he's a fool. Everybody knows it. Don't let him get to you. Okay, and she's trying to let him know, like, we all know what he is. You know, don't take it as such an insult. Everyone knows this guy's the son of Belial and that he's a fool. He's, that's why his name is Nabal. <laughs> now, therefore, my Lord, as the Lord liveth, as thy soul liveth, seeing the Lord hath withhold me from coming to shed blood and from avenging thine, thine self with thine own hand, now let thine enemies and they that seek evil to my Lord be as Nabal. And now this blessing which thine hath made had brought unto my Lord let it even be given unto the young men that follow my Lord. She's talking about the food. Let this blessing be given unto you. I pray thee, forgive the trespass of thine handmaid, for the Lord will certainly make my Lord a sure house. Right? She's talking about, you are going to be king. You will have a sure house. Because my Lord fighteth the battles of the Lord. She's saying, look, I know the battles you fight are the right battles. You fight for the Lord. And evil hath not been found in thee all these days. I know your testimony, David. You're right. You're, oh, you've always done right. The way you've been handling Saul, you're going to have a sure house. You're fighting God's battles, the way he took on the Philistines, so on and so forth. And she's saying, look, I know you, your reputation, you're a good man. Yet a man has risen to pursue thee and to seek thy soul. She's referring to Saul, of course. But the soul of my Lord shall be bound to the bundle of life with the Lord thy God. And the souls of thine enemies, them shall he sling out as, the middle, as in the middle of, a, of, out of the middle of the sling. So she's talking about the fact, you know, Saul's pursuing you, but don't worry, God's going to deliver you because you fight the Lord's battles, because you always do what's right, David. And it shall come to pass, look at verse 30, this is where she starts to kind of ease into this, here's why you shouldn't do this, here, this is why you're making the wrong decision. And it shall come to pass, and the Lord shall have done according to, uh, my, my Lord, according to all the good that uh, he has spoken concerning thee, and shall have appointed thee over, the ruler over Israel, that this shall be no grief unto thee, nor offense of heart unto my Lord, either that thou hast shed blood causeless or that my Lord hath avenged himself. You see how she's saying, look, when you come into your house and, you, and you're finally made king, you don't want to look back on this, this day and this deed that you're about to go do and let it be a grief of heart to you. She said, one day you're going to regret this. You know, when you finally are king, this is going to be a reproach on you. This is going to be something that you're about to, you're going to if you follow through on this, you're going to regret it. She's telling David he's wrong. That is, he shouldn't do what he's about to do. But notice how she's doing it. She's doing it very humbly, very meekly. She's really buttering him up, right? She's sending all the food. Oh, you're going to be king. You fight all the Lord's battles. You do everything that's right. And he, she was right about all those things. It wasn't just flattery. But she's easing into this, okay? This shall be no grief unto thee, nor offense of uh, heart on my Lord, that thou hast shed blood causeless, or that my Lord hath avenged himself. When that Lord hath shed dealt with my Lord, then remember thine handmaid. And David said to Abigail, Blessed be the Lord. And get out of my way, wench. <laughs> right? No, he listened to what she had to say. You know, this approach works. You know, this is, a, and this is a principle that we can apply in our own lives. Of entreating, you know, pacifying people by being nice to them, giving something, maybe a gift. I'm not saying you've got to make a meal like she made, but a little gesture can go a long way with people. A little bit of kindness can go a long way. 
And then they might be a little bit more open to hearing what you have to say when you come to them with humility and meekness and say things in, a, in the right way. Because often when we're right and we know we're right, we want to just make sure they, that the person that's wrong knows that they're wrong and we're right. We've got to make sure we do it in the right way as well. It's not just what we say, but how we say it. And David said to Abigail, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, which sent thee to meet me this day, and blessed be thy advice. And blessed be thou which hath kept me this day from coming to shed blood and from avenging myself with mine own hand. He's like, you know what? You're right. I was going to go avenge myself. For in very deed as the Lord God of Israel liveth, which hath kept me back from hurting thee, except thou had hasted and come to meet me, surely have I not left unto Nabal by the morning light any that pisseth against the wall. So David received of her hand that which she hath brought him and said unto her, Go up in peace unto thine house. See, I have hearkened to thy voice and have accepted thy person. So it works. Come, you know, it works out for her. Abigail saves the day. You know, all, all the guys that up in, up in Nabal's house are all, whoo, <laughs> praise God for Abigail. I'm glad we have her to go talk to. I'm glad there's somebody that has some good understanding that we can approach. And what's great about this story is that we learn this other principle in closing is that the Lord will repay. Right? And that's what Abigail is saying. Look, the Lord's going to avenge your of you of your enemies. Like she, he's going to avenge you of Saul. And, and, and we see in verse 36 and, and onward is that, you know, the Lord does repay. Okay? And it says, And Abigail came to Nabal, and behold, he held a feast in his house like the feast of a king. And Nabal's heart was merry within him, for he was very drunken. So he's just in there living it up, right? Just getting drunk. He's not, he just tells David off like it's nothing and just goes about his merry way. And the guy had no idea how close he was to just being snuffed out. He had no idea that this whole army was marching up the hill to his house while he's in there just getting drunk and having a feast. They would have caught him, you know, just staggering out, and it would have been a, just a bloodbath. He has no idea. But it came to pass in the morning when the wine was gone out of Nabal, that his wife had told him these things, that his heart died within him and he became as a stone. It's a very interesting story. <laughs> I mean, Nabal, it's Abigail's like, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you in the morning when you sober up. And, you know, when you have a little bit. You know, if she knows, well, I go tell him now, he'll probably just blow it off. He won't even remember because he's drunk. So she, he, he comes, you know, he wakes up. He's got the hangover or whatever. And she goes in and says, hey, I got something to tell you. <laughs> I saved your neck yesterday did you know david was almost here and he and it sets in on him you know it's it finally settles in like i was i almost died and it says that his heart died within him and he became as a stone now i don't know what exactly what medical condition the bible is describing here but to me whenever i read this i think about it like a brain aneurysm or something maybe there was just like a all of a sudden like the lord caused it or maybe it was just like the stress or something, I don't know, like caused something to pop and it just like he had a stroke practically or who knows what it's describing, but he just basically dies and becomes like a stone. Just, I mean, just imagine that. <laughs> imagine it so I don't have to do it, okay? <laughs> right? He's just, you know, unresponsive, basically. And it came to pass about 10 days after that the Lord smote Nabal that he died. So the Lord does avenge his own, right? And when David, look at verse 39. This is kind of where David kind of admits that Abigail was right and that he was wrong. And it came to pass, uh, excuse me, verse 39. And when David had heard that Nabal was dead, he said, Blessed be the Lord, that he hath pleaded the cause of my reproach from the hand of Nabal and hath kept his servant from evil. He's talking about himself. He has kept his servant from evil. He's saying, God, God went ahead and avenged me and kept me from doing something that I would have regretted, going up there and just killing everybody. Because who did God kill? Did God kill everybody that pissed against the wall? No, God killed Nabal. The one guy that, you know, it wasn't the servants. The servants are going, well, hey, we pissed against the wall. This is us he's talking about. And we were with them in the wilderness. We know that David's a good guy. And they're sweating this. You know, they were on David's side. So God, you know, he takes, when he takes things into his own hands, he doles out justice appropriately. When we tend to take things into our, hand, into our own hands, we go overboard. That's kind of what we see with David. He gets mad. He gets up and says, Nabal, he says, well, now everyone's going to die. 
It's not going to be just Nabal. I'm going to just wipe all of them out, right? But, you know, that would have been the evil. Yeah, and maybe we see here that Nabal had it coming being the son of Belial that he was. But David would have taken it to an extreme. And God here, when he doles out justice, it's just Nabal that dies. And David says, well, you know what? He's kept back his servant from evil. He's admitting what I was going to go do would have been bad. It would have been something like Abigail said. I would, have re- I would have regretted this later in life. This would have kept me up at night and been killed everybody. For the Lord hath returned the wickedness of Nabal upon his own head. And, you know, I want to close real quick here. On, you know, that's kind of, the, 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 I think, the thrust of this, of this sermon, or the thrust of this chapter, what you can really learn from this. This principle of, you know, not taking things in your own hands, but also that when, you know, uh, the, the, the things that you say, that the weight that your words carry, okay, and, and, and for good or evil, you know, you can be a Nabal and run your mouth and suffer a lot of co- bad consequences. Or you can use, use your words wisely like an Abigail and pacify anger and turn away wrath and, and, and persuade people, even in, in, in people in positions of power and authority. But uh, the last thing I want to close on, because whenever I see this, I always point this out because this is something that I've just noticed people, and I have too in the past, that struggle with when it comes to Bible reading. And that's this principle. And you need, if you didn't hear anything else in the sermon night, you need to hear this if you're serious about your Bible reading and you want to understand Scripture. This will help you to separate statements from stories. Separate statements from stories. Sometimes you read, people read a story in the Bible like we're about to read here in this closing verses and they think, oh, well, that man of God did that. It must be okay for me. Okay? Because how does the story end? And it says there at the end of verse 39, And David sent and communed with Abigail to take her to wife, verse 40. And when the servants David came to Abigail to Carmel, they spake unto her, saying, David hath sent us unto thee to take thee to him to wife. Now David already had a wife. In fact, we're going to read here at the end, verse 43, And she goes and becomes his wife. David also took Ahinoam of Jezreel. Uh, They were both of them his wives. But Saul had given him Michael, his daughter, uh, his, his daughter, David's wife, to Faltai, the son of Laish, which was of Gal- Galim. So David, you know, his first wife is taken away from him, but, and then he gets two more. And then, you know, if you know the story of David, he has many, many, many wives. In the Bible, God specifically told Israel that the kings were not to multiply to themselves wives. They were not to do that, okay? But he did it. He did it anyway. And the problem is, is that people will read stories like this, and this is just one example. You say, well, David did it. You know, obviously it's okay for a guy to have multiple wives. Look, and there's people out there that have multiple wives. And it's funny because even, even people that would think it's okay, they don't, they, even the people that don't practice it, they still think it's okay. You say, well, they all polygamists? No, but they think that there's nothing wrong with it. Or that it was something that was okay. Now, back then, it was probably more permissive, especially if you were the king. It was kind of expected behavior. But that doesn't mean it's right. Okay, and this is just, I want to close on this because this is something, and you know, I'll preach it till I'm blue in the face, I'll say it over and over again, and then people will come with questions, and I'm not mad about it, but it's just, I sell, I'll, I'll tell them the same thing, I'll tell them right now. You need to separate statements from stories. When Bible says, you know, thou shalt not do this, or thou shalt, and then you see somebody in the scripture doing the complete opposite, that doesn't mean they've nullified scripture. It just means they're wrong. It's just showing us that David is a sinner like everybody else and made bad decisions. You know, that's one thing you can see in this story. And not trying to put David down or, or make him into a bad person. I'm just saying that, you know, uh, even good people do bad things, you know, and, and make mistakes. So hopefully, you know, there's a lot in that chapter. Obviously, it's really long, but, you know, there's a lot of great lessons we can learn, uh, you know, from Abigail and even from um, um, and Naboth himself, you know, and from David, you know, that we need to make sure that, we don't just take things into our own hands all the time, you know, and that if somebody comes to us with the right spirit, you know, and tries to help us, you know, we should be open to that, even if it's, even if it's, we're being told wrong, you know, even if we don't agree with that person, you know, David agreed with her, but you know, sometimes people will come and tell us, hey, you know, they'll come with the right spirit, they'll come with a humble attitude, they'll come in and do it out of love, and they'll say we're wrong, you know, even if we don't agree with them, we should still appreciate the fact that they've come to us out of love and out of and in a right spirit try to, to, to correct us or speak with us. Even if we don't agree with them. 
It doesn't mean we can still say, oh, I appreciate what you had to say. You know, and, and we should not always just assume that because somebody's telling us that we're wrong about something, that they're saying we're a bad person or that they're upset with us. They just want to avoid us, help us avoid from making mistakes that we might later regret. Let's go ahead and pray.